before Winston Churchill became Britain's savior in World War II, he was a political disgrace and a blowhard. He was known for being a braggart with a huge mouth. Or as David Lloyd George, the prime minister in 1916 put it, Churchill would make a drum out of skin of his own mother in order to sound his own praises. And that's coming from one of Churchill's greatest political supporters. Before Churchill was flawlessly coordinating the Allied efforts between Franklin D. Roosevelt and Joseph Stalin, before he was giving rousing speeches about fighting Nazis on the beach and in the streets, Churchill was getting kicked out of high office in the First World War. As the First Lord of the Admiralty, Churchill had sent a sizable chunk of the British Navy to the Dardanelles, a 38-mile strait that cuts Europe and Asia off from northwest Turkey. We could dedicate an entire episode of to Churchill's failure at the Dardanelles, both the strategic importance of what he was trying to do and how heavy the Allied losses would be. To be very brief about it, Churchill asked his Navy to do the unthinkable. He asked them to thread their ships through the eye of a needle and shoulder their way through a minefield that had already destroyed six major ships. Also, Churchill could put Constantinople, the Turkish capital, under siege. Had it worked, it would have been the masterstroke of the First World War. Churchill was young, though. He planned by the numbers, not by the man. He couldn't have guessed how hesitant his admirals would be. Seeing the Dardanelles and the mines in front of them, Admiral Sackville Carden had a nervous collapse on the deck of his ship. The British War Office refused to send the troops Churchill asked for, and the Admiral's replacement ordered a withdrawal before the Navy could push through. The Dardanelles was an utter disaster, and it would cost Churchill 46,000 Allied troops. Churchill was forced to resign in disgrace, and the words, remember the Dardanelles, would haunt him for the rest of his political career. It would be shouted by his opponents in Parliament. Remember the Dardanelles. But Churchill was not a man to be discouraged for long. In later years, he would shout back just as loudly. Quote, the Dardanelles may have saved millions of lives. Don't imagine I'm running away from the Dardanelles. I glory in it. You're listening to The Reengineered You. This is a podcast about self empowerment and all the myths, lies, and misconceptions we tell ourselves. Then we use science and history to bust those myths and re engineer a better you. I'm your host, Todd Laments, the extrovert. And I'm the writer, researcher, and introvert, Joe Anthony, whose job it is to dig through the outer layer of no duh on the internet and get to the facts. We all remember teachers and mentors who went the extra mile to give us honest, specific encouragement. Mentors who saw our gifts and encouraged us to hone them. Or even better, coaches who saw us stumble and talked us into getting back up. You probably also had bosses who believe in negative encouragement over positive. People who believe wholeheartedly in the pressure cooker style of management. So today, we want to break down encouragement. What works? What doesn't? And we're starting with three myths. Myth one, how does encouragement work on the brain? What's more memorable, negative encouragement or positive? And if we remember negative encouragement longer, why not use it? Myth two, pro runners have fans cheering them at the finish line. Basketball players have cheering sections. And soccer players have rowdy armies ready to storm the field. So clearly, encouragement has an effect on physical performance, right? Myth three. What's the limit of what encouragement can do? I mean, there's only so much hope you can give someone 
in a hopeless situation, right? We'll get into the signs of encouragement. But first, I want to share with Joe how Churchill faced his darkest loss and what he did to get back into the war. So from what I could read and and some of what the historians were sort of going back and forth about uh, in these articles, apparently um, back in the First World War in the Dardanelles, they were using like older Navy ships. So Churchill was like, if we lose those, we're fine. Even though there are, well, I have men on all, all of them. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's the part that really confused everybody. Like everything I could read, our, our narrative, we open with you know him saying that like he he planned by the numbers. I don't think he was thinking about the instinct of admirals to save their ships and men. <laughs> that, that that goes against every instinct to just drive into a mine. Or if you're of a st- different status class, you don't see the value of life the same as. That could have been part of it. Um, we'll get into the controversy over Churchill and what he did in India a little bit. Um, but yeah, a lot of his early career, from what I could pick up on. Do you feel the same way? Like, Do you think he was just sort of like looked at a graph of numbers and he's like not registering them as people? That's exactly how I see it. He did the math and didn't really, and was young, didn't have a lot of experience. And the experience he did have wasn't very, particularly positive. So maybe he was probably in a position politically that he probably shouldn't have been. He's playing like a board game of risk, basically. <laughs> yes. Where 47,000 people perished. Right. So how did he, how did that affect him? Like he's, he's, I love that title, by the way, the Lord of the Admiralty. Can I be that for this podcast? <laughs> You're the Lord of Admiralty all every day. Okay. <laughs> so how do you get drunk In your own mind. <laughs> yeah. Well, although it is kind of. I'm not going to say heroic, but at least redeems a little bit of this, I think. Um, you can you can tell me whether or not you agree on that part, but when he got drummed out of the Admiralty, when he was basically left in disgrace, he immediately turned around and joined the infantry. Oh, and they ran to the front with a, with a gun in hand. Yeah, that's Admiral, right? To not just quit and give up and... Yeah, like that, that, uh, that kind of merits him maybe a little bit of the heroic... Uh, um, lionizing we do of him that he joined the the Royal Scots Fusiliers and that was a frontline group in World War I um, so maybe some of that hype is, is earned a tiny bit as we learned from a Napoleon episode wasn't a political stunt uh, yeah now that you mentioned Napoleon <laughs> yeah it kind of does seem like it doesn't it a little bit I mean, yeah. he ran to the front lines, but not to the very front lines. He's not, yeah, like Napoleon. So anybody who hasn't heard our Napoleon and Manipulation episode, Napoleon had paintings of him, like holding the flag at the bridge he supposedly took. And we found out during that episode, he was blown off that bridge and just laid face down in a puddle until he was rescued. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we may have another sort of Napoleon uh, here with Churchill. And I, I can speak for the world, I think, with Winston Churchill was not built for battle. Yeah, no, he looks, they called him the English Bulldog. That was them being very generous toward him. He was, he was more like a English drunken Bulldog who just like, yeah. Because he had really short limbs and legs. Breathes heavy his whole way through the war. But, um, but according to the histories, he, he went to the Royal Scots Fusiliers after he was, um, drummed out of the Admiralty. And then after that, eventually he was given a, a new government position, the munitions minister. Um, when the, the guy we mentioned in the opening, David Lloyd George, became prime minister and um, saw Churchill's value as sort of like, not really, uh, it would be way, way, way going too far ahead to call him like the, in Game of Thrones term, varies. Like he wasn't a spy master, but he definitely had networks of like intelligence. So that's kind of how he stayed in the game up until the Second World War. But for all intents and purposes, this Dardanelles disaster would cost most people their political careers. Anyone but Churchill would have just been out of it forever. Yeah, like never it would have been the disgrace that, that their family died on. Um, so there is coming back. And, and Todd, I, I was going to ask you about this. Do you feel like encouragement means more when it comes from somebody who has fallen on disgrace, who has taken that big trip? Someone who can empathize with what they've been through? Absolutely. And I think when they say it, their sincerity shows more. 
yeah than someone just giving you advice on something they just read off facebook have you ever gotten encouragement from people who like you can clearly tell they have never had a hardship <laughs> yes yes and it it infuriates me it yeah it, it makes me jealous and angry at the same time it does not make me want to like pick up and keep going it belittles me so our whole episode today is does encouragement work as as mentors and as sort of a self-help podcast we kind of need to nail this down i'm surprised we're on episode 51 and we haven't talked about whether or not encouragement works um well and i think the big thing joe is i think a lot of people think i don't need any encouragement i'm tough enough to get through life no one's ever encouraged me right yeah, and that's how we feel as human. We shouldn't need some a pat on the back. We should be so self aware and so confident. We don't need anyone telling us we're good enough. Right. We should be our own motor. Who who needs somebody to to give us a, a sign and say go team? Um, by the end of this episode, we will cover exactly what does work, and that's that's really the focus we want to get into. But first, we're going to uh, crap all over people who are doing it like mentors who are raw rawing their way through life. Um, so first one, because, uh, Todd is into sports and I don't know what that word means. Um, <laughs> we'll start with what is the home team advantage? I've, is that a real thing? It certainly is. And I want to give you an example from the NFL. So for Joe, that's the national football league. Okay. Never heard of it. <laughs> well, when you have a home game, you have 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 of your fans, the noise of your fans, the colors of your jersey. I mean, when you go to a live game, you can almost feel the love and the testosterone. It's a real weighted thing in the stadium. And you can also feel the hate for the visiting team. So the visiting team has this like lead blanket on them. Now you might ask how noisy it is. So when the offensive team has the, the ball, who's the visiting team, the crowd screams so loud that their voices, they won't have a voice the next day. They can't hear themselves think, the players on the opposite, on the visiting team. So when the home team goes up to play, it's dead silent. So the home team screams the focus out of the visiting team, basically. So bad that the visiting team, when they know they're going on the road, they practice with very low, loud noise machines playing heavy metal music. So they have to practice doing things with no sound. No way. They mm -hmm. Guantanamo Bay themselves to like train. And as far as encouragement goes, I'm going to take a team, the Green Bay Packers. They're famous for this. They've done this for years. Um, in their, when, they, when they're playing a home game and they score a touchdown, they run to the crowd and the crowd all puts their hands out and the player jumps up into their arms and everyone hugs the players. And they've done this for years. So isn't that encouragement? That's incredible. Okay, I got to ask, what is the song that plays when you are training for uh, an away game? Like for you specifically, Todd, not your team. Like what is the song that would play when you're like trying to train yourself up? Guns N' Roses. Guns N' Roses. Okay, that's <laughs> Any good Guns pick. Roses that's song. <laughs> something, it, it's heavy enough to distract you, but also encouraging. Mine's Why Can't We Be Friends. That's, that's what I'll play. <laughs> um, do you want some statistics about whether home field advantage exists or not? I first found a Washington Post article that basically said it's it's not a real thing, but I, I that was questionable. I'll let people who have read that article argue with me, or specifically, I'll let them argue with 538. So we're going to side with the um, statistical website 538 for this, and they say 57% of games are won by the home team. Uh, and they go into why um, a, a lot of their breakdown. I mean, like always, they go heavy into stats. That's but not ninety percent, though. Yeah, that's that's seven percent is a big shift when you're talking game, um, and a lot of that is apparently running. Like uh, they they go into why running the ball is easier uh, on a home game. They they get really nitty gritty. I encourage everyone to look at our notes to read why. But home field, home field advantage is definitely real. Like, that's not something we're making up. Um, I was going to ask Todd, uh, when is a time that encouragement worked for you? Because we're breaking down when does encouragement work. So I was wondering if we had some anecdotes to sort of lead us into the science. 
But one of the big ones for me in my in my sales career was I was a sales manager at this car dealership, and I had a boss. His name was Tony, and he was impossible. He was my, you know, he's the person I answered to. He was so difficult. He was so mean. And he said to me one time, and I was in charge of a crew of salespeople. He said, I don't want any of these salespeople talking to me directly about anything. He said, I want them to talk to you, and you come and talk to me. And I thought, what a jerk. And for years I thought, what a jerk. And it was stressing me out because I, a lot of times they have to communicate with him. I don't have time to do these, run these messages all around. Finally, I couldn't handle it more. I was so exhausted. And I said, I'm done. I, I'm going to have to quit. I can't take any more of your shit. He looked stunned. And he said, you're my best manager. I can't lose you. He said, I've learned so much from you. And I was shocked. And he said, your crew is the best crew we have. So then I didn't want, I didn't want to quit anymore. I thought, right. oh my God, I won over this mean bastard. So then I ran to my team and I told them, hey, Tony loves you guys. And they were shocked. <laughs> <laughs> we were all floored. But we all started to perform better. We started to come in a little earlier. We started to work a little later. Our sales numbers went up. Our gross profit went up. All because you got the approval of disappointing dad, finally. Well, there's more to it than that. So 10 years later, I'm in the same position that Tony's in. And I noticed that I started losing my temper with some of the salespeople. And what I realized was, and this comes from maturity, the reason he did that was to protect those people from him. Hmm. He put an isolation because he knew he would yell at them and make things a lot worse. And then I started doing that to people, and I realized I needed a buffer I need someone to, I can't talk to these guys who are in the first grade. I need to at least talk to high school kids on this stuff. You need a Todd. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So did that um, encouragement from Tony, did it mean more from him because he had been uh, in your position? Like, do you think his, his experience had an effect on that? Um, I think that just just him being like the, the dad thing. Okay. It was a higher authority, I guess I would say. Gotcha. Okay. What what about you? Do you have anything writing wise in your career? Yes, um, we we did an episode a couple episodes back about entourages, and we talked about how I didn't recognize this until we had gotten to the science of entourages. Um, but your best encouragement sometimes comes from people who are not masters of their field, but people who are about six months ahead of you. Um, I was writing uh, for a um, international contest, still am, and uh, I had been taking all these classes and these boot camps and these you know special sort of like Q and A's from from literal masters, people who are like have dominated their field for twenty years, and it wasn't helping as much as I mean it was great, but it it wasn't helping as quickly or as effectively. Until I found somebody who had just won the contest I was in, um, and he 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 completely dominated his year, but he was only a couple years ahead of me, and he had been writing and helping other people online, and I got into his um, like sort of his orbit and started taking advice, and it helped immensely and immediately, and the encouragement he gave was absolutely uh, mind blowing. And something that um, we will cover in this episode is apparently it matters who the encouragement comes from. If somebody is um, inept and encourages you, it won't mean as much. If somebody is miles and miles ahead of you and 20 years ahead of you, it won't help because they won't know the steps. They will have forgotten the steps it takes to get to where they are. Because that rejection and those baby steps are so far behind them. Though. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're, we're going to jump into the science of encouragement and sort of, um, we want to know what the actual physical effect of encouragement is when you get encouragement, what does it do to you physically? Um, so would it surprise you to know that, um, sincere praise is like being given a gift? What's the, what's the best praise you've ever been given? What, when is somebody giving you praise and it's like warmed your heart? I have had lots of praise from family and friends from when I was a little kid to coaches and stuff. But recently I gave a speech 
And after the speech, this man I know, his name is Andreas Vargas. Um, we were in a big group setting. This was before um, the COVID stuff when we could all meet up. And usually people come up if they see your speech and they were moved by it and say, yo, man, I really like this. Or, oh, thank you for sharing this. But Vargas, he was different. He, Andreas, he pulled me aside and didn't just pull me away from everybody else. He took me out in the hallway, down the hall. And I'm like, what's going on? He kind of took me by the arm. And he said, thank you for talking to me, doing that speech. I felt like you were talking to me. I've been having this problem at work. I didn't know how to verbalize it until I heard your speech. And the way he said it so sincerely, it was just a huge compliment. That that word you use, sincerely, that that is such a key part to what we're going to talk about today. Um, if we can give a spoiler to anyone listening, um, if you are giving encouragement to somebody, sincerity seems to be sort of like the really big gold standard for giving good encouragement. And for as good as, you know, my point in this is the way he said it made him feel was great. Him saying that, I guarantee felt 20 times better to me. Right. Yeah. I'll never forget that till the day I die. Did it feel like you had been given a gift? Yes, a huge one that I'll never forget that you couldn't put a price on. Okay. I'm about to put a price on it. Uh, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, first, I want to hear when you've got encouragement. Okay. Um, I think the best encouragement I've been given uh, came from uh, people who had read something I had written, but they were in the same, um, not class, but in the same sort of like level of writing that I'm at, where where they had been through the same classes, been through the same uh, contests, and they came back and told me I had done something they didn't know how to do. That's the best encouragement I've been given. So it's very different than someone who's just a, even an avid reader who says, oh, yeah, I really like your stuff. Someone right. who has a credibility who's competed that you look either into their eyes or up to them. The the writer Orson Scott Card had a really good quote. He said, the only honest thing an average reader can tell you is that they want more. But somebody who has been in the field and has written and who has you know, studied, they can tell you why they want more. Um as we get go through encouragement, we'll, we'll sort of reveal why it's important to have both genuine encouragement and encouragement from people who are a little bit ahead of you in the game, whatever your game is, whether that's football, lifting, writing, whatever you're into. Um, so there's a there's a part of the brain called the ventral striatum. Um, pretty much all mammals have a, a system called the limbic system. Uh, and it's the circuitry for reward behavior, basically. Anything you do in life that, that your brain wants you to do more of, eating, sleeping, drinking, emotional responses, um, it, it's, it's the limbic system. Fires up the dopamine. Fires off the dopamine. Here we go. <laughs> We're getting into dopamine again today. Everyone who's listening to this who has heard like enough of these episodes, they're like, God, they're talking about dopamine again. Um, Good stuff. We need it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The it, the reason dopamine comes up so much in our episodes is we are a podcast about self empowerment, and a lot of that comes down to what makes us feel good about doing an activity, and we need that encouragement. Um. So the same areas of the brain, and, and this comes from uh, we'll link off to our articles about neurology and how it works with encouragement. Um. The to summarize, the same areas of the brain um, that light up when we receive literal money or romantic attention, uh, the ventral striatum and the medial prefrontal cortex, those light up with dopamine when we get encouragement. So you getting genuine encouragement that is honest and it's a fair um, summation of what you've managed to do. If you get the proper encouragement, it is like receiving an actual physical gift. Part of the reason why this is important, and we're going to talk about this over and over throughout this episode, that high, that dopamine high of being encouraged properly, that gives your brain the reward to tell you do it again. 
Um, and if you get encouragement again, and if you if you do repeat the activity, you get the same sort of uh, echo of dopamine. It's it's the do it again, do it again, do it again, and that's really what you want out of good encouragement. Um, compliments also sort of improve long term memory. Um, so this is sort of a, a more modern research thing. Um, memory consolidation and building of long term memory. Uh, um, are affected during your sleep if it's something you've been complimented on. So literally, if it's something that you felt good about doing during the day, like you got encouraged, <laughs> you'll remember it better. Your brain will be like, let's let's encourage that. Let's let's put that circuit to work while you're asleep. You dream about it and just lather yourself in it. <laughs> right, exactly. I, I mean, like... Have you ever like had dreams where like somebody is praising you and then you wake up and you're like, oh yeah, that felt good? Well, I did, uh, real quickly, I, just, um, I used to play basketball daily when I lived up in Seattle and the, the place I played was very competitive. There was some NBA players that played there, all Division One players. And there were some real urban kids that are rough around the edges and never talked to anybody. But there's one kid and I he would never talk to me. He's rude to everybody. He's a rough, tough street kid. And I once complimented him on how quick and fast he was. Hmm. Joe, five years later, when he sees me, this is a kid who never smiles. As he grow up into a man, he lights up every time he sees me. He remembers my <laughs> name. He runs up to me. And if I went to Seattle and saw him today, and it was just that one-time compliment, you could just tell he just swelled with it because I think in his life, he hadn't heard a lot of that growing up. I love that story. And that it's... It completely illustrates the point, which is we remember good praise. We remember sincere praise. Sincere especially. praise being that it wasn't he wasn't a buddy of mine. I wasn't making trying to make him feel better. Right. We weren't acquaintances. It was just something I was like, Oh shit, you're friggin' fast. You're not gaining something out no, of that. No agenda. Do you want to talk about what happens when we get insincere praise? What happens if you are doing it to impress somebody? Um, have in, you ever been the boss shows too, right? Oh, absolutely. Have you, have you been the boss in a room and somebody like laughs too hard at your joke? Uh, no, no. <laughs> <Not that funny. laughs> like I wish that I knew what that feeling was. Yeah. Um, so insincere praise still gives you dopamine. So if I turn to you, Todd, and I'm like, man, you are smart. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. Well, if, if Todd turns to me. And is like, geez, Joe, you're you're great at you know punching those keyboards or whatever. Like, word puncher is actually my title at work. But if we compliment each other on something that is insincere, um, I'm I'm trying to think of examples of when I've complimented people and I didn't actually mean it. Um, I barely compliment people when I do mean it. You're measured with what you say. I, I mean, measured. You think about it. You don't just throw off. You know, Rosie compliments very much, not your style. Right. But having come from the public speaking area, we have both gotten insincere compliments in the past. It 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 feels kind of good in the moment, that, but the more you sort of analyze it, the more you you realize that that person probably didn't mean it. Um, there is an effect in in the research. Like they talk about how you get the same dopamine surge, but it builds distrust like like you actually res, um, release cortisol, like the stress hormone, when somebody gives you praise and it doesn't match up, like it doesn't feel sincere, your brain recognizes that and it starts sort of stressing out a bit. Like the cortisol dump that you get from that, it makes you distrust that person. And so it nullifies almost completely the effects of the praise. Well, and it guards you. That's why the cortisol kicks in. Because oh, yeah. you know they're trying to con you or something because the sincere, genuine one, you want more of that. Exactly. They don't have an agenda, but someone who's laughing a little too hard is right. Got an angle. So to to um, uh, sum this up and to reflect, and this is something that they have backed up in uh, functional MRIs, the magnetic resonant magnetic resonating uh, resonance imaging. Um, the researchers found that all of these were um, assumed, but completely and totally backed up that receiving monetary gifts. Uh, um, lights up the same social reward section as just getting good old-fashioned praise that is meaningful and specific. Um, now, there's something else I got into. Uh, this is an article called Hardwiring Happiness. 
Uh, and this is by Dr. Rick Hansen. Um, he talks about that the brain has a negativity bias. Have you ever heard uh, of, what do you call it, uh, loss aversion or risk aversion? Or have you heard of like, have you ever heard of people talking about how they remember negative things longer than positive? Oh, absolutely. In the sales, I've been telling this for years. So you could have a thousand people that are polite and say, no, thank you. Those one or two out of a thousand that are rude, you remember them forever. Right, exactly. Um, I also remember uh, a cracked article that came up where they talked about how uh, in sports, professional athletes remember losses longer than they remember uh, victories. And they actually remember it in specificity. They can name the scores. They can name positions that were played. They can name like what happened on the field. So it is worth mentioning just briefly that we are kind of uh, built to recognize and to remember losses and criticisms longer. But that doesn't mean you should praise less. That doesn't mean you should use the negative part as a training tool. It is way more important because of that to give out good, honest praise more often than you give negative praise. Um, I'm going to give just a really quick shout out to um, the book Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. He talks about um, Israeli Air Force uh, trainers uh, trying to get uh, Air Force pilots to perform better. And he was saying that one of their standard training techniques was to um, scream negative things, like like anybody in the military. They, they correct you with negativity, basically. Uh, you know, drill sergeant style, like, you know, you can do better, you know, calling you maggot, I assume. I've only seen movies. <laughs> Yeah, other things, too, that rhyme with that. Way worse. <laughs> Way worse. Um, but generally speaking, something Kahneman mentioned in his book is that we regress to the mean. Um, you can scream at people all day long if they perform badly. Um, but if you are trying to correct somebody's performance by um, yelling at them or being negative, eventually everybody regresses to their own mean, their their average performance returns. Um, it's the same thing in sports as the, the myth of the hot streak. People can be on a hot streak. People can be on a slump, whatever happens, but their skill level will true them out. They will eventually regress to the mean and they'll return to their average performance. So ultimately negative encouragement doesn't do anything except make you a memorable dick and it doesn't improve performance at all. Well, the new trend I've seen in all athletics is, you know, coaches, you think of sports coaches yelling at everybody to get the most out of them, right? Yeah. But what happens now with the best players? They just totally kiss their ass and tell them how wonderful they are in front of everybody. And then the players who are the fringe players who they know aren't going to make the team or are not going to play, they rag on them and verbally abuse them. Right. So, you know, so the people who are the best don't need any more encouragement, but they still, you know, to be popular coaches. Do you think those coaches are just like securing their career? That's part of it. Okay. But they get good work by being positive with those guys, by reinforcing them, they get better play out of them too. I totally believe that. So we kind of asked this um, when the, the episode opened. Um, in your opinion, why is it that people who have faced adversity make better mentors? They have actually felt the pain and the failure and the embarrassment. And that's why the sincerity shows. Um, someone who's older and wiser and been through something that you've been through, whether it was six months ago or 10 years ago, but if they still remember that or they've been through it multiple times, when you get older, you've been through the broken hearts, the bankruptcies, the failures more often than most. Um, they've already read this book. They've already saw this movie. And they sincerely don't have an agenda and they don't want to see you, Joe, make the same mistakes that they've made. Okay. Not having an agenda. I hadn't really thought about that angle, but I think that is completely true. Well, when we go ask for advice from somebody, one of our friends and family, we know exactly how they're going to answer us. And if they ever go off that case, they ever say anything different than we planned on, don't you get pissed off? M is pissed off or surprised? Or, or I often think, you know, are, are you putting on a play for me? Um, 
we're our, our big subject today is Churchill and how he sort of made his comeback. Do you think that people wouldn't have like? Do you think Britain wouldn't have listened to him quite as much if he hadn't had the Dardanelles? Like if he hadn't been disgraced and come back? I think this was probably the best thing that ever happened to him, and not because all these lives were lost. It's the way he handled it. He just turned it around. He he did a 180 on it. And his fact was, and what he screamed and told everybody, was this mistake could have saved millions of lives if it would have worked. I had the best intentions. And I wasn't afraid to make this choice. And that's why he always said, I glory in him. Right. And how he flipped it around, Joe, when you would think, you'll never, you make a mistake like this, it's political uh, suicide. You're never going to be able to run for office. You're never going to be trusted again, right? Mm -hmm. He said, I learned this horrible lesson. Who better than me to lead this country and not make this mistake again? I think that is a really good point. Do you think that somebody who had, I mean, like the mistake we're talking about, let's get really, really specific. He sent people to die. Like like he told his Navy, drive into mines. Yeah, let, let me make this real specific. There was this very, very narrow, narrow channel of water. Mm-hmm. There were mines in it. A whole bunch of ships had already been destroyed. So when he ordered them to go in, the captains and admirals of the ship said no. One of them got, they, they, were, they weren't willing to do it. The ones had to do it. Practically had to have a gun held to their head. One officer passed out from the stress. Right. And these are war general or admirals, whatever you call them. These are not men that usually pass out from stress. But they knew it was a suicide mission. So this was a really, really bad decision. And he didn't listen to any of his great military minds he had around him. He was a dumb kid and thought he knew better. Right. So when he came back, when he was... uh you mentioned that he he said he he said he gloried in the Dardanelles because of what it meant to him, what it built him into. Um, we we hinted at him coming back during World War II, uh, just for I mean, I of course remember what Churchill did during World War II, but for any of our listeners that don't, maybe fill me in. I mean, fill them in. Okay, so Joe, you and I are both big history buffs, and we've studied a lot about World War II. To me, Winston Churchill will always be linked with who? Our hero, our favorite president, FDR, right? Right. Now, FDR was a three-term president who dragged the country out of the Depression and World War II. Winston Churchill was in a similar situation. The difference being, Britain was under war. I mean, it was streets were bombed. I'm looking at a picture right now that kind of tells... So he took over during, during World War II. It's a picture of a, it's a famous picture of a milkman walking through the rubble. You, every all these buildings are smashed. There's debris everywhere. You can see sh- soldiers running around for their life. And there's almost this comically guy in a white jacket, a milkman carrying <laughs> milk bottles. Quintessentially British. He, his stiff upper lip is carrying him through the rubble while he goes to deliver his milk, and just everything <laughs> is bombed out. They're always stuck up, aren't they? Nothing humbles those Brits. Right. It's got like a yeah. A nice collar on his shirt. It's perfectly pressed. But the point of this is... This is when Churchill becomes prime minister? Exactly. The the year was 1940. So he couldn't have come in at a tougher time. So probably the public thought, this is the guy we need right now to save us. The bulldog. Okay. But Winston Churchill was up for the challenge. And I'm going to quote him right here. Quote, All my past life has been a preparation for this hour, for this trial. And that included the Dardanelles. Okay. But he was confident he's ready to take this on. So when we talk about people who have been through it before, that's who we're looking at. And a veteran of World War I and a lot of political power. He obviously had his supporters. Okay. Because he didn't do this all on his own, as we know. Now... I'm going to make a loose connection here that may be unfair for me to make. Uh, We just did a General Grant episode where we found out General Grant was a crappy student in in West Point. How'd Churchill do in school? And FDR got gentlemen's grades at the Ivy League. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Gentlemen's C's. 
Well, Churchill wasn't much better. This guy barely got into military school. So I'm thinking his parents may have made a little bit of money. Okay. He was terrible in foreign languages, which to <laughs> me is funny because you think of him as communicating with everybody from all over the world, right? Right. He literally becomes the guy that like uh, um, coordinates other nations during World War II. He sucked at other languages. There were more subjects he was bad in the, than there were ones he was good at. The only t- two that he did well in was history and English. And I don't know, you know if you know this, but Churchill was a hell of a writer. I have read bits of his uh, autobiography, and I've read a couple of his, his articles, not even to mention the, the speeches that we're going to talk about later. So uh, he, he was a hell of a writer. But as far as <laughs> in military school, one time he took a two-hour Latin test. He sat there for two hours. He didn't answer one question. So it was all <laughs> Latin to him, literally. All there was was some <laughs> smudges on his paper. He couldn't get one thing right, or hello, or what's your name, you know. We know that much of every language ourselves. Okay. Could could you say, hello, my name is Todd in Latin? <laughs> okay, well, I can't either. So to start his military career, he had to start at the Royal Military College, and that's at Sandhurst. But there was a problem. He twice failed the, ex- the entrance exams, twice. Okay. So then he got a military tutor, and I'm making quotations in here in Mm -hmm. my hand. This, again, sounds like a family deal. He finally qualified his third time around, but he qualified for the cavalry, but only for the cavalry, not the infantry, because the infantry was way harder. So he had to find, he took this third time, found an easier bucket, and slid in. Uh, I just want to remind listeners, um, leading people during a time of war is not like a driver's test. It's not like take it until you pass. It, it is literally leading people to their, their demise. Now, another shocking thing uh, that this surprised me, digging doing the research. Okay, the queen is the most British person, right? The queen. Okay. Don't you think it's Winston Churchill being 100% British in every way? Yeah. His mom was American. Really? <laughs> How did they let him lead any office if he had any any uh, Yankee in him? No internet back then. Oh, okay. They didn't look it up. Yeah. Okay. Now, this one just blew my mind, and you, you brought this up to me offline when you were doing the research. Churchill did not like, of all people, Gandhi. Right. Who the hell doesn't like Gandhi? That's like not, not liking Mother Teresa. Right. Uh, too peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> Throughout his whole career, he opposed any kind of autonomy for India, period. Okay. And he had a very strong dislike, get this, for non for the nonviolent leader, <laughs> Gandhi. Okay. Hell with those peaceful protesters. Right. Yeah. Just kill people 47,000 at a time, right? We, we're we not going to, we, we could dedicate an entire podcast to what Churchill did with um, the, the colonies and with India and, and why uh, Churchill statues got attacked during Black Lives Matter. To, to say the least, uh, he is a uh, controversial figure in British history. He talked about some real sad stuff, and I'm going to put this in my own words. He, he referred to Gandhi as a sidious middle temple lawyer. And that he was a faker from the East. Strong words toward uh, a peace figure. He even thought he wanted Gandhi to die during a hunger strike. Like let him starve kind of thing. Wow. He referred to Gandhi and Gandhi's people as, now this was a different time. He once asserted, for example, that they were savages and barbarous people. Okay, so there you have it. Churchill's... uh uh, we'll say more controversial uh, takes on on India, and we will remind everybody that uh, that is not reflected by the re-engineered you. We are merely talking about how he performed during World War II. Winston Churchill and tell yeah, is politically correct, right? Right. Um. So here's the part we want to sort of like uh, we wanted to figure out, or at least um. Uh, answer the question 
uh, does yelling at people at the gym work when they're trying to do something? Like, like if somebody is pushing up a heavy dumbbell or, or if they're benching, um, does screaming, you can do it behind them, actually make them lift the weight? Um, so I'll, I'll ask first, Todd, in your experience, if somebody runs up behind you while you're doing a, a performance sport, d- does somebody yelling, good job, keep it up, does that help? I think it does. I think with working out, having that partner with you, but I do think it's more of the subtle being there with you, not the, it isn't going to, if you can only lift 200 pounds, someone's screaming at you that you can do it, bro. Ah, it's not going to make you lift 300 pounds. Okay. I have, um, I, I have a, my own experience in athleticism is uh, I like to uh, work out in the dark without anybody there. <laughs> and if anybody tries to encourage me, uh, I just glare at them. I stop whatever I'm doing and I stare. Um, we have a, a couple of studies we want to cover. Uh, one of them is from Bloomberg University of Pennsylvania. And these are both small sample sizes. Whenever we, we talk about studies on this show, we like to point out when it's a small sample size so that it can be sort of taken with a grain of salt. Um, but this uh, University of Pennsylvania, it was about 28 students. They put them on a treadmill and they tried to make them, uh, quote, elicit a maximum effort uh, in uh, less than 12 minutes without any verbal encouragement. Um, And at the end of a three minute exercise, uh, they were rated for their performance. And then they they had another segment where they were given verbal encouragements. And and tell me if these would make you run faster or better. Way to go. Come on. Good job. Excellent. Come on, push it. Keep it up and let's go. And these were all rehearsed by um, beforehand by investigators who were told to keep it at a constant volume and accompanied by hand clapping. So would these have encouraged you? Yeah, I think so. I will tell you one thing I do like about this group, even though it's a small group, we always make jokes when it's a college group of 28 people usually like, of course they're gonna be positive about everything. But I think this one's important because these people are still in their physical prime. Yes, these are college students. They don't have the arthritis, they don't have bad knees, they don't have respiratory problems, yeah. (laughs) Right. So this is an even, Right, it gives you sort of a, a general baseline to to base a performance off of. When I'm getting inspired, just listen to this. Push it, keep it up, let's go. What about you? Is this working on you? I would get annoyed at whoever's yelling at me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think we respond differently to encouragement. Um, so the, the, the study, what they reported, uh, they said that it led to significantly greater maximum uh, effort. Um, Really? Yeah. Just um, corny <laughs> clapping. <laughs> yeah, you'd you think could that do w- it. <laughs> wouldn't really help. Uh, I mean, like like you said, it corny. That's the way I found it. But um, they said that it, it did, in fact, lead them to do better performance. Um, there are uh, counter studies. Um, there was one from the Journal of Medicine and Internal Research. Uh, HBR covered it in one of their articles. We'll link off to that. Um, they reported, again, another small study uh, that they found the opposite. They said that people perform better when they were silently assisted um, and that words of encouragement did not help them. Um, For that study, uh, a man named Brandon Irwin uh, had subjects in a lab perform sets of abdominal exercises called planks. What is a plank, Todd? A plank, as I'll show you, is when you stand up, you sit down straight like you're doing a push up, you lay on the ground, and then you put your elbows together and you support yourself like this. Are you watching me? Mm-hmm. It's all core, it's very uncomfortable. You do it in yoga, all the athletes do it. And okay. You try to hold it for a minute. It's the longest minute of your life. I Okay. Um, it sounds uncomfortable just watching you do that. Um, they basically did the exact same test. They, they, they gave them these three encouragements. Come on, you can do it. You got this. Um, and they said that the partners that had, um, the, whose partners were silent, so the coaches that were just quietly looking at them, they did planks 33% longer, while those who got encouraged uh, went about 20% longer. Well, I think part of this encouragement, I think that's its own form of encouragement, is when you have someone there who's an expert, who's watching you and you're trying to, you know, you're trying to impress them. You're trying to not let them down. You want to show them you did more than before. Right. 
And they're there with you, so that shows that they're sincerely interested in your health. The fact that they met you at the gym, they're on your team, they want you to win. Todd, you are exactly on the conclusion I took away from these two studies. Um, to me, these studies were arguing with each other. Like one was encouragement doesn't help. The other one is encouragement does help. What is conclusive, the one we can take away from both of these, is having somebody there is important. Having someone who is um, maybe uh, not better than you, but somebody who has been through it, whatever you're doing, and is in your corner and who is sort of like helping to judge your performance that makes the difference. Um, both these groups had better performance than if they were left alone, uh, but the one where it was somebody who was paired up that they had more experience, that that made a bigger difference. Well, you think about, too, what everyone grows up, and what do they talk about? You know, my dad or my mom never came to any of my games, never came to my recitals, and that always bothered them. And you see kids light up when their dad or mom comes to the game, right? Right. And what is that? That's a form of encouragement. Right, exactly. So secretly, this the, what we're getting from this study, everybody just wants their dad standing behind them nodding quietly while they, they do a plank, which is what I'm going to take away from this. Um, so why was Churchill the master of encouragement? Was he sort of like a nation's dad? Was he just like, I came to your ball game and you're bombing out? Well, you've studied this guy, and you're a public speaking, you're a speech geek. How powerful do you think his public speaking and his personal, his professional persona was in making him a powerful leader and, and a legacy that he has now? Um, the, you are told, if you get into public speaking, to read his speeches, Churchill, because the structure of what he does is uh, incredible. Um, there's something that uh, the writer um, Robert McKee points out that all good stories have. It's called a value change. It's where you go from a negative value to a positive. Churchill writes in that style. When he does, you know, we will we'll fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them on the streets. He starts with how crushed they were in France. So, no, he is a master of language. He is a master of, of uh, public speaking. So he does the what what we're at now, this bottom, and what's possible. Exactly. Yeah. Now Churchill was known by everyone um, in in the parliament. All the leaders, they knew what a great speaker he was. He knew how emotional and, and how much he could um, motivate, inspire the whole country and actually the whole world. So this is what said. I'm going to quote Edward Moreau, and this is how he put it: "Quote, now the hour had come." For him to mobilize the English language and send it into battle, a spearhead of hope for Britain and the world. We have joined together some of the, I like this, Churchillian pros. It sustained, it lifted the hearts of the island of people when they stood alone. That is awesome. Churchillian pros. That's yeah, fun. Right? And then talking about the island and the people were down, they stood alone. Right. Can we? How would you feel about sharing some of that Churchillian prose? Would you? Would you be okay with reading a couple of these quotes? I don't think I can do it justice. I'm no bulldog. I don't have a cigar. I'm not drunk, but I'll try. Okay. I like this one. This is blood, toil, tears, and sweat, and it's from May 10th, 1940. And this is about how Churchill's talking about the Nazis. Okay. And this is a quote: "You ask what is our policy? I will say." This is dealing with the Nazis. It is to wage war by sea, land, and air. He also assured the commons of his commitment and stressed how high the stakes were. And this is my favorite part, the last part of the quote. Without victory, there is no survival. Very nice. I like that. Yeah, that's we're all in. We're going to kill these Nazis or they're going to kill us. Right. So... I kind of wanted to go over a, a study I found and, and bore you with what is the what is the most hope can do for us? Like what what encouragement, what is the maximum that encouragement can do for us? I like this study. This is my favorite one. Okay. It's not about people, but this one really resonated with me. I, I read ahead a little bit. Okay. Um, so 
anyone who's listening who uh, might have a, a warm heart for animal cruelty, you may want to uh, take a moment, uh, um, uh, get some fresh air, uh, maybe listen to some classical music, because this, this gets a little bit dark as far as mice go and how um, anti-depression studies work with mice. And we're all animal lovers here. We are, yeah. Um, we love animals more than people, trust me, both of us. <laughs> yes. Much better. We discovered that during our uh, uh, our episode about um, uh, Grant, that when, when he, we were talking about how much he loved his horse more than people, we both sympathized with that. Um, so there is a very classic study in uh, antidepressant medication. One of the ways they test antidepressants is they will take mice and they will test how long mice can swim. And the way they set up this test, it's very simple. They have a clear glass jar and it has no doors, no obvious ways out. And they fill it with water and they put a mouse into that water and they just let it swim. And the reason why this is a good test for antidepressant medication is uh, depressed mice, um, uh, mice that are low on dopamine, um, they will only swim for a couple of minutes before they give up and drown. Now, depending on what company is doing this test, they sometimes don't let them drown. But regardless, this is cruel, right? Yeah, it's friggin' scary for the mice, right? Yeah, at, at the very least, the, the mouse thinks it's going to drown. Yeah, would you like to be thrown in a pool and not let out, you know? Right, exactly. Uh, I, I play the the game The Sims, and I do the same thing by removing the ladder, and it just you just watch them swim forever until they give up. Um, so this is called the mouse swim test. This is a very famous test in in science. Um, they have found that um, a a depressed mouse will only swim a couple of minutes. A mouse that is on good antidepressants will continue swimming. They, they will swim for hours sometimes. Um, and this is just lab mice. Like, they, they have tried this test with uh, feral or field mice. Mice grow up in the wild. And the idea is um, field mice are tough. They're mean. They're scrappy. They should be hardier and able to swim longer. Yeah, they've had survival situations where they've had to run for their lives and hide. and Yeah, they're, they're used to... They run from cats on the daily, so why not? Um, but they found that it's the opposite. Instead of swimming for hours like happy lab mice, the wild mice swim for like a couple minutes before they let themselves sink. So they don't see a door or a way out, and they don't see what they're used to seeing, which is grass or a hole to hide in. When they don't see any way out, they just go to the bottom, basically. They're, they're hopeless. Right. <clears throat> But the mice that last the longest in these tests, they're not the happy lab mice, the ones that are raised by humans. And they're not the wild mice either. It's mice with hope. They, they swim the best. So the way they give mice hope is they will pick them out of the water and they will dry them off and they will put them back in the tank. And the ones that are handled by humans, by, by the lab uh, assistants... They swim the longest by far. Uh, um, antidepressants help, but basically giving them encouragement of any sort uh, extends the length of time that they can swim before they give up. Um, the, the longest I could find, and I actually went digging trying to find you know, how long these guys could last, the longest that were being uh, regularly encouraged and dried off and being handled, they could go for um, almost a day. That's a lot farther. And I know we're not mice, but we see this in people. We think, oh, I'm so tough. I don't need any encouragement. I never had any encouragement. I've never had anyone believe in me. But that's total BS. Complete. The, the people that last the longest and have the most hope and achieve the most have had people do that, take them out of the water and, and giving them some love and encouragement and, and send them back on their way. Right. You, you may be talking to somebody who is tough. You might find someone who's scrappy, but I guarantee if they made it as far as they have, they got encouraged. The whole way by all kinds of different people. Right. Exactly. Um, so we don't want to really end this episode without telling everybody what happened to Churchill. Um, I mean, of course, he, he helped win World War II. Uh, he, he became... A, a symbol of the nation, like he, he became Britain's bulldog. Um, 
how did things end up for him at the very end? Politically, this is terrible. He was finally winning the war. He had dodged a whole bunch of bullets, you know, got all these other countries on side with him, had all the allies and worked together. It was the 11th hour, and he was forced to resign because he lost the election. Really? Yeah, and he lost to it. It was the, the, the Labor Labor Party, and Clement Attlee, the Labor leader, was sworn as a new British leader. <laughs> I never knew that. I thought Winston Churchill was, you know, parades in the street and everything. He was voted right out of office. Voted out as he was winning. What a slap in the face after winning the biggest world war. That's crazy. I mean, whereas we were ready to just elect FDR until he he literally died. Like, we would have kept him in office like as the winner for as long <laughs> as he would have sat there. Uh, if it was like American politics, though, uh, whoever came in after him would have taken credit for winning World War II. Uh, this, this Atlee guy would have been like, yep, I did that in the last hour. But, like all good comeback scrappers... Um, he became a leader again. He ran for the other party, and in 1951, he was elected prime minister. So it wasn't totally over. Okay, that's awesome. Now, two years later, he was knighted, and then by the queen, and then he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature for a six-volume historical study of of World War II, and of course, the whole world of his favorite of his famous speeches. That is awesome. So recapping, in 1951, he was a prime minister once again. He did that for four years, and he retired in 1955. But he still remained in the parliament and government for nine more years till 1964. And he died in 1965. Now, Joe, I'm going to ask you something. This overweight, short bulldog raging alcoholic Mm -hmm. cigar smoking lived to the ripe old age of 90 Uh, i would say that's unfair but given what he did for his country i suppose there's a little bit of fairness to that only the good die young right right (laughs) he's a mean old cuss (laughs) lost in criticism are more memorable they stick with us or we hang on to them like a bad habit. But this doesn't mean we should use encouragement less. In fact, it's just the opposite. We should use encouragement far more because when it's given in sincerity, encouragement and praise can hit the brain with the same intensity as giving a physical gift. When you give encouragement, you are in fact giving a reward. The jury is still out. If we perform better at grueling tasks, receiving constant encouragement versus silence. But we do know for certain that having a workout partner or study buddy can increase our exertion and output, especially if they're a little more experienced than us. Finally, if it's fair to compare mouse behavior with human behavior, then hope and encouragement can mean the difference between sinking and swimming, literally. Especially if the person giving you encouragement has been neck deep in it before and can empathize with you. The best mentors and the most encouraging words come from men and women who have faced down their failures. Because when someone like Churchill encourages you to pick yourself up and fight on, they know what it took for you to get back up in the first place. Or, as Churchill put it, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. You've been listening to the Reengineered You. Thank you so much for listening to the show. You mean the world to us. We have a new episode every week. You can connect with us at www.re-engineeredu.com. That's where we have research links, show notes, and blog articles for each of our episodes. We appreciate feedback, and we love spirited debate. We're not experts in anything, but we've got an opinion on everything. 
Speaking of opinions, we have a quick shout out for somebody. Uh, you may have heard in the last couple episodes somebody giggling in the background once in a great while. We're not used to hearing laughter when we make jokes on the show, but we've had somebody sitting in for the last few episodes. So, uh, Rachel, do you want to say hi? Hi. So, Rachel has been helping us with uh, a couple of our research points and study points. So, uh, thank you, Rachel. And helping me pronounce words that I can't. <laughs> And helping with French pronunciation. For anyone that comments in our comment section, I know I did not say Fogwa correctly. (laughs) 